<laughs> Anybody ever uh, had some things happen that you just couldn't explain? Some unexplained phenomena? We had our, our neighbors that live behind us. Uh, a lot of you have, have met them, uh, Terry and Ruthie Harris. And uh, I was talking with Terry, and we said about how just thinking about the universe and what's on the other side of everything we know, and then what's on the other side of that, right? And thinking that maybe when we get to see Jesus, we'll have this understanding. But there are things I don't understand, and there are things that are unexplainable, things that you don't normally see. There, there are some times where it seems like perhaps uh, maybe we've come into contact with an angel, or maybe sometimes we've experienced a, a, a closer look at the demonic. There are things going on that with our physical eyes we can't see, but they're just as real and usually more real than what we can see. Uh, some of the things we can't see make the news reports. A uh, mysterious stranger at the scene of an accident, right? We don't know what happened to him. He just showed up and then he disappeared. Uh, Near-death experiences that people might have. Uh, so many of them see the light and the tunnel. So many similar things. Some see Jesus and some see loved ones and and while this doesn't get into quite as many news stories, some see hell and are very grateful when they come back. Some people have open visions and open dreams. We've been looking at evidence of Christ in the Old Testament. And we're going to wrap up this series today. But one thing to keep in mind is that so much of this we can see proof of in the prophetic. We can see uh, proof up in typology. And as we're going to look at today, uh, seeing proof in a Christophany or a theophany. But one thing we have to keep in mind, Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. You know, it's entirely possible that God is going to do something different than you've ever seen Him do before. It's entirely possible that He's going to do some things that you are aware of, that you're going to be a witness to, that you can't understand. But God is God. And God's going to do what God's going to do. As we started this out, when we looked at the prophetic uh, evidence for Christ in the Old Testament. We looked in Deuteronomy 18, 15, and we took that one prophecy that, that Messiah would be a prophet and showed how that came to pass. And, and during, that, during that message, we talked about the odds that one man could fulfill even eight of the Old Testament prophecies about Messiah, and, and the, the odds were 1 in 10 to the 17th power. And we have evidence of, some say, up to 300 fulfilled prophecies that either Jesus fulfilled in His first coming or that He's going to fulfill in His second. And then we looked at typology and talked about Melchizedek, a one who was a priest and a king who had no beginning, no end. He had no genealogy. He didn't come from the right line to become a priest or a king, but yet in Genesis 14, we see that he is called a priest and king of Salem. And today we're going to look at Christophany and kind of build that to, or bring that together with theophany. So theo means God, and Christo means Christ. So sometimes we see in the Old Testament evidences of what we call a theophany, and sometimes it's more specific. And, and maybe I'd like to give you some examples of that. First of all, the idea of identifying Christophanies is a little harder to ascertain what is what, because so much of it is opinion, right? Uh, for instance, Melchizedek. Melchizedek seems to fit all three in a way. 
that some people believe that Melchizedek himself was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. I don't know. Someday it's one of those things that when I get to see Jesus face to face, along with understanding the universe and the endlessness of it and, and eternity past and all those things that make my brain hurt, I think I'm going to understand when I see him. Maybe this helps. We do have biblical examples of post-ascension appearances of Christ. When Paul was on the road to Damascus, then known as Saul, right? His whole purpose in going to Damascus was to round up Christians and send them to court, take, bring them back to Jerusalem and try them. And he was on his way to Damascus and, and he fell and he was blinded by light and he heard a voice and he said, who are you? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Now, Paul was the only one that got the full effect of the vision, but the three times we read about it in the book of Acts, there's a little bit more information each time. We know that the men who were with them knew something was happening. They didn't get the full impact, but they recognized that something supernatural was happening. So there's an occasion of a post-ascension appearance of Christ. And Paul, later on in, uh, in Galatians, speaks of how he spent time in Arabia and that he received a doctrine that we, we hold today. When you think about Galatians, Ephesians, the book of Romans, the doctrine that we gain from just those three New Testament books is incredible. And he says in Galatians, at the very beginning of the book, that he spent time in Arabia and Christ himself told him what he should write. So there's a second example of a post-ascension appearance of Christ. And then we have, uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, we have examples there. The first five words of the book of Revelation are the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the apostle John uh, had this vision of Christ. Now, in that case, he was the only one who saw this because he was the only one there. But he write, wrote, and we have uh, in, in our Bibles the book of Revelation, it's a vision ca that came to John. So let me see if I can maybe come up with an illustration or a difference between a theophany and a Christophany. On Mount Sinai, after the children of Israel had come out of Egypt, and they were in the desert, and they had spent uh, 50 days, roughly, uh, in the desert. They came to uh, Mount Sinai, and it's where God gave the Ten Commandments. And when they were there, when God spoke from the mountain, they perceived God speaking in thunders, in thunderings, and lightning, and smoke. Exodus 19.16 says, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Exodus 20 it says that now when all the people saw the thunder, yes, you heard me right, saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us or we'll die. So if God is spirit, when God speaks, it's not going to be a voice like we experience. And here, uh, the, these, these Israelites were gathered around this mountain. And, it, and the way that the ESV renders this, they saw the thunder. Well, how do you see thunder? That means they perceived it. It, it, it sounded like thunder. It looked like lightning. They had no other way in their minds to explain what they were seeing because what they were seeing was quite unusual. If we think of that as a theophany, an appearance of God, God manifesting himself that you could understand his power and his, his nature and his holiness. Can you imagine what that would have felt like? especially if you've never experienced the Holy Spirit in your life. And, and here is just this overwhelming presence and power of God on Mount Sinai. So much so that they said, Moses, um, how about you just talk this? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I could handle this. 
But yet Moses had a relationship with God that he was able to receive instruction from God that he could put into words that would be inscribed on tablets in the language of the people, the Ten Commandments and all of the other laws that dealt with the sacrificial system. Exodus 33, 11 says that God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. Is it at least possible that the smoke and fire and the thunder and lightning that the people experienced was a theophany and the conversations that Moses had with God was a Christophany? A pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Christ existed along with the Father and the Holy Spirit from before time began. If God had the Son in mind in the fullness of time, then it's not much of a stretch to think that the personhood of God that was able to communicate with Moses may have been a Christophany. In Genesis 1, we read that God spoke the world into existence. In John chapter 1, we read that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus the man did not exist until he was born as a baby with an earthly mother and a heavenly father. But the Son always existed. Really, when we speak of uh, Christophanes, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, we can't really know for sure. Right? It's one of those things there has to be a little mystery about. We can be informed, however, by Scripture and about the, the character and nature of God to make decisions like this. But there certainly is a role for the Son to have in the Trinity, which existed from before the foundation of the world. So what is that role? Well, we're going to look at that. The, the purpose is not today to identify a theophany, a Christophany, the prophetic, and all of these things. It's not so that we can have a uh, an education about how to identify these things. Here's the role today, and here's the purpose. To open your eyes and hearts to the possibilities, to the advantages, and to the reality of God's desire to intervene in our lives for our good and for His glory. If you're here or listening to this, uh, 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 on live stream, and you think you've just got everything all figured out, tied up in a nice, neat bow on top of this box, and you've just put God there, and you've said, I have, I have achieved everything that I need to know about God, then I feel sorry for you, and I want to encourage you to let God out of that box. Now, now we have a guide, and we have the Word of God, which... <laughs> If you look at it in its entirety and understand who wrote it, when they wrote it, who they wrote it to, you will have to come to the conclusion after reading Genesis through Revelation that this book agrees with itself. So you get to know the character and nature of God through this word. So we're not going to take something and just, you know, derivate from this and claim that God is something that he's never revealed himself to be, right? There's enough of that goes on yeah. Yeah. in some buildings with pews and a steeple. So we're not going to do that. We stay within his character and nature. But if, if you don't realize that there's so much more untapped for you as a child of God, you're missing out. <laughs> we're not just to get saved and hang on till heaven. We think we're just going to have to wait until we see Him face to face to experience the deeper and richer things of God. God, help us know this is what He wants for us. He wants a life that is rich and full. And so whether you experience a manifestation of God according to your natural senses or not, we can live and have been recreated to live in the supernatural presence of God. We need to hone our spiritual senses. 
to be aware of this and realize that God has so much more for us. A couple weeks ago, I read this passage from Ephesians 3, but I'd like to read it again. And I'd like you just to focus on this and just hear it. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And the man who wrote that did not have a casual, casual relationship with God. Amen. The man who wrote that down is saying, man, I have just, let me tell you about some of the things that I have gleaned from my time. Jesus himself gave me so much of this, and I just can't wait to share it with you, and I want you to experience it too. Amen. And, and I just, I cannot, I cannot, and I will not spend the rest of my life just getting in front of a group of people one or two times a week and just saying things so that we can learn things. I cannot and I will not just do that. This is about leading you into deeper experience with God because of Jesus Christ and through the person of the Holy Spirit. So how do we, how do we, how do we maybe rephrase this? If you're saved, there's more. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's more. If you're sanctified, <laughs> there's more. <laughs> if you've been delivered, set free, there's more. Amen. If you've been to church all your life, yes. there's more. Amen. Even if you've experienced a Christophany, there's more. Yes. There's always more. There's always more. Too many times we, we get into this whole thing of, you know, we have, we have those spiritual hallmarks and those dates that we remember, right? I remember when I was 18 years old, and I finally gave my life to Jesus. I knew better, and I still was holding him, right? I remember when I was 19, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he literally sat me down in a pew, and I knew nothing about any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I came to, I was speaking in a heavenly language. I didn't know anything. I was not taught about this stuff. I, I remember times as I've gone through my life that, that certain, certain things that used to be uh, a stronghold in my life went away. Yeah. And, and today, I anticipate tomorrow. How, how am I going to know Christ more completely tomorrow than I did today. You, you, cannot, you cannot get to a point where you think you've just checked all the boxes and you've achieved this and just kind of coast. I mean, you can, but I'm not going to let you feel comfortable about that. There's more. There's always more. I want to tell you a story today of Abraham, the first Hebrew first one identified as that, Abraham the Hebrew. And we are going to get into the Word here. I'm going to encourage you to, to open your Bibles. It's not on the screen today because there's, there's a lot we're going to kind of walk through. Uh, plus, it's good to look at the paper version once in a while, you know. Uh, Genesis 21, get, uh, find your way there uh, while I gave you a little background. 
God promised Abraham that he was going to make of him a great nation. And Abraham was, it seems, the first in his family for a long time to be able to hear the voice of God. He was a descendant of Shem, uh, which is where we get the word Semitic. Um, so, so at one point, you know, he could trace his lineage back to Adam uh, and Seth and then through Shem. But it had been a long time since man's ears were tuned to hear God. And somehow, God got Adam's, or Abraham's ear. And because Abraham listened, and Abraham obeyed, even when he didn't know what was going to come next, he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the sands on the seashore. I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he brought Abraham into uh, the land of promise that would not be possessed by his descendants for quite some time. But he brought him into this land. Abraham followed him. Uh, he promised him that through his descendants all the world would be blessed. And Abraham was an old man, his wife Sarah. She was an old woman and she had never had children. And they got to thinking that maybe they'd help God out just a little bit. So uh, Sarah said, why don't you go have a child with my maidservant, Hagar? You ever get ahead of God? You ever just figure, well, what harm could there be? I'm just going to help God out because, you know, after all, he needs a little help. But you know what's interesting? Even though Abraham and Sarah messed up, and this wasn't the only time they messed up, God's promise remained. Hmm? God's promise remained. And at some point, of course, when Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, Sarah kind of regretted. You can imagine how she would have felt. It would have been very awkward. So Hagar and Ishmael had to leave. So we read it in, in Genesis where uh, they were out in the desert, and Hagar had to, couldn't even look at the child. She had to get way far away. All the water had run out, and she's like, well, we're going to die. I can't bear to see my child die. But God spoke. God spoke to Hagar in Genesis 21, 15 to 18. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And Ishmael is considered the father of the Arab race of the Arab peoples. Verse 20 says, And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. Uh, he became great, not just like an expert, but like the best there is, great. Interesting, isn't it, that God, even in Abraham's disobedience, still blessed the object of Abraham's disobedience. God made a way for Ishmael to be a blessed man, and, and for his relatives and descendants to be blessed. And he put them in a land that has some of the richest oil deposits <laughs> in the entire world. And how did that happen? God spoke to Hagar, an Egyptian, spoke to Hagar. How did he speak? Perhaps a Christophany. So then, we, we get into some more of this kind of thing in Genesis 22, where, where Isaac has been born, the child of the promise, and God is going to test Abraham to make sure that he's still hearing from him. This, this is sometimes hard for us to hear, but 
Let's read the Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Don't know how Abraham heard God. Don't know if it was an audible voice. Uh, don't even really know a lot about the language that Abraham conversed in. I mean, Hebrew, yes, but uh, I would love to hear what that language sounded like then. I think if I were Abraham, I might have said, say what? You want me to what? You mean I've been waiting? I'm 100 years old. I've been waiting all this time to have this child of the promise. And, and you said that through, through my seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And you want me to do what? And I don't know if Abraham said that, but if he did, it's not recorded in the Scripture. And we know that Abraham was obedient. And he said, go to this area, to Moriah, where God led him to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is one of the most disputed pieces of real estate in the Middle East today. Mount Moriah, the place where Abraham built this altar and was prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac. Also, it's the location of the, the temple which would be built down the road under Solomon. And it's thought very close to Mount Moriah is where Calvary was, where Jesus was crucified. It's a sacred site amongst Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And, and the idea of who controls that mount is still very much uh, in the Middle Eastern politics today. Verse 4 and 5 says, On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I am the boy. will go there and worship and come to you and come again to you. He built a fire and he got things ready. By the way, I think it's important to notice that Abraham somehow figured God was going to work this out because he said, we're going over there and then we'll be back. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Somehow he knew that he was going to be coming back with Isaac. So they built a fire, got things ready, and Isaac said, Dad, where's the lamb? And what did Dad say? He said, God will provide. Amen. Verse 11 to 14, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. <laughs> he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went, took the ram, and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. It says here an angel of the Lord. Interesting. We hear that a lot of times in Scripture angel of the Lord. The uh, book of Daniel is replete with all kinds of references to the angel of the Lord, different angels. And sometimes they're named, what the angel's name is. But here, angel of the Lord. So, literally it means a messenger or a representative of the self-existent one, Jehovah. That's our English transliteration. Jehovah, Jehovah. A messenger of the self-existent one. And it's interesting too, that when he said he named the place the Lord will provide, that's Jehovah Ra'ah, and it simply means that, the Lord who will provide. So, then 15 to 18 continues, and the angel of the Lord, again, called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand that's on the seashore. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. 
Now, of all of the richness of this biblical account, here's some of the things that we take from this that are so rich. God will provide. The faith, right, that Abraham had. Jehovah Ra'ah, God will provide. Even when he had no clue. <laughs> no clue. As far as he was concerned, he was ready to place Isaac on this altar. And when Isaac asked him, where's the lamb? Even then, Abram said, God will provide. And, and, and if we took nothing else from the story, there's something we need to hear today. Amen. To stop worrying about having everything figured out, right? right. To have everything planned and, and every I dotted and every T crossed, you know? I mean, there's nothing wrong with making uh, plans and preparations, but when we get so hung up that we, we say, well, God could never move because of this, well, then we're, we're missing the whole point. So if nothing else, we take God will provide. But there's more. Think about the level of obedience that God requires. Right. Yeah, okay, Lord. But see, right now it's kind of a bad time. <laughs> I just don't really feel that good. Uh, how, how are we going to pay for it? Uh, I can't do that. Just, just simple obedience. Something else we could take from the story, right? Just take God at his word. Abraham's willingness to follow the Lord at all costs. Even at the cost of giving up his only son. Who else gave his only son? There's a lot of typology in this as well, right? And then God blessing the result of Abraham and Sarah's disobedience. <laughs> Sin causes circumstances and, and things that still exist even when the sin is forgiven, no doubt. A lot of that we're still fighting today in the Middle East. Right. Huh? Right. We're still fighting a lot of that disobedience in the Middle East today. Do you ever stop and think that what's going on in Israel and Iran and, and all of the, the region over there, that Jesus is the answer for both sides? Jesus is still the answer. And then the typology of Isaac is something we pull out of that. The, the typology of the ram in the thicket, God will provide. And we, we can see a foreshadowing of Christ in this as well. But today I want to focus on the supernatural way that God spoke to Abraham. That the character of God, that he would stop Abraham before he killed his son, and the sovereignty of God. That he chose Abraham to be the father of a chosen race of people. The covenant-making God who kept his promise to Abraham even though Abraham disobeyed God many times. The fact that we can see in this Christ's vicarious atonement that he took the cross, he died in our place. That's what vicarious means, right? He took our place. And we can see that foreshadowed in his provision of a ram to be sacrificed. And a bit of irony, too, because this disputed piece of land, Mount Moriah, where, where thousands of years ago God revealed Jehovah Ra'ah, where God spoke to Abraham, perhaps in a Christophany. Because an angel of the Lord can't come around and say, I have declared that you will, your descendants will be a great nation. An angel doesn't have that authority, but Christ would. Here we are. The people are still fighting that in that part of the world today are still denying that Christ came into the world as a fulfillment of the prophecy given to Abraham. And that through his descendants, of which Jesus is one, think about that, the whole world would be blessed. And the whole world has been blessed Amen. through Messiah. Christians are, are not uh, connected with a nation. It goes beyond that. It's the kingdom of God. It's not an earthly kingdom. Right. And people are still fighting today as we speak. They are still fighting and hoping 
to create by their own work a different result than what God has decreed. How ironic that today, in that region of the world, the fighting goes on. Jesus is the answer. He has always been. He will always be. Jesus is the answer for the Jew, for the Muslim, for the lost. He is just still the answer. Today, we hear many stories on the increase of Muslims having a vision of Jesus. What are they seeing? They're seeing a Christophany, a post ascension vision of Christ. Recent studies indicate that there are more Messianic Jews in the United States than ever thought before. Because a lot of them keep it quiet so that their families don't know. Central Pennsylvania has had an increase in the Christian Arab population. As a matter of fact, First Assembly of God in Harrisburg has planted an Arabic speaking church. The question that's been asked for many years is, how can there ever be a third temple on Mount Moriah? Because right now the Dome of the Rock is there. It's currently under Islamic control. How can it ever happen? (laughs) God. But God. How could God take an old man and and his his old wife who has never given birth, and make him the father of many nations. Our God is in the heaven. He does all that he pleases. So whether you ever experience a vision of Jesus or a theophany, an audible voice, manifestation of the Holy Spirit, you can experience God. And you need nobody's permission to do so. You can be in his presence if you choose to. It is something to anticipate and to expect. You can experience him now. Right now. It's what he wants for you. I'm going to ask you if the team could come get ready. That privilege we have of coming into his presence, can I tell you what it's not dependent upon? It's it's not based on anything you've done. You don't have to be Abraham and offer to present your own son as a sacrifice. You don't have to be Hagar and, and be faced with a lifetime of struggle. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist, a board member. You don't have to say a certain prayer in a certain order, wear certain clothing, sing a certain song, be in a certain place at a certain time. Hey, a building is a great thing, and that's for our benefit. But it's not about even being here. It's solely because of Christ. You can bring nothing else before the throne of God, right? Right. You can bring nothing else. You're not there to impress Him. You can't say, well, I, boy, I've been to church every week since I was. Great. What's that have to do with your standing before God? We bring nothing before the throne of grace but Christ. But Christ. Who who in this mystery that I can't quite understand and makes my head hurt, always existed with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And he was the only one that could become a flesh and blood man and take our place. Who who could take the penalty of sin that we so deserved, and he did not. But he took it on our behalf. So that we could have life abundant, and we could have sins forgiven, and we could be made into a new creation. And we could be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and we could right now choose to come into his presence. And there's absolutely nothing the world can do to stop it. There's nothing your enemy can do to stop it. No matter if you're in a prison, a physical prison, you cannot be barred entrance to the kingdom of God. This is an incredible privilege that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. And I dare say that many people, many people who claim to follow Jesus give no thought to how close we can get 
if we simply choose to. He wants to meet you today. If you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never, you've never been saved, you've never come to the end of yourself, you're just trying to get better each day. Well, maybe tomorrow I'll do better. And then tomorrow never comes. Maybe I'll stop doing this next week. Maybe I'll start doing this next month. It's just a waste of time. Never happened. Do it now. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come in and change me from the inside out. Make me a new creature. And I trust what you did on Calvary. To, to, to be forgiveness for all of that sin and hope right here on out through eternity. You've been seeking God about maybe being filled with the Spirit. Just, just, just receive it. Can I just make it that simple? Can you just simply receive it and say, say thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. You know, one of the, the, we talk about evidences of the oh, Holy Spirit. We're going to get into some of this in the, the next series, but how about power? I'm not denying some of our core beliefs. Let me just say, Jesus, only one time in Mark's gospel, did he mention the fact that we will speak in new tongues. But I'll tell you what he said a lot of times is you will receive power. Yes. Yeah. Receive that power. Yes. You need to be delivered. You feel like you're being demonized, that, that Satan is just working overtime on you. Let him do it. Receive it. Believe it. And live your life accordingly. Amen. You need a healing in your body. Yeah. yeah. Receive it. Amen. Receive it today, just like you receive salvation. Say, I receive that, and I'm going to live my life accordingly. I'm going to thank you for it. Amen. Do something today to indicate your willingness to follow Jesus on that level. Amen. The, the Bible talks about how we should live, and it, 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 it teaches us about yielding to Jesus, but it doesn't say a lot about what we're doing right now. We've made most of this up. It's not evil, but we've devised this kind of stuff meeting in a room with a slope floor and orange pews and, you know, all this stuff. We, we meet together. It doesn't matter where we meet. But I am going to ask you to do something that the Bible is clear on, is that do something to indicate your willingness to follow Jesus. Abraham made a three-day journey to Mount Moriah to show that he was willing to do what God was asking him to do. Hagar went into the desert. She left. She had no idea how God was going to provide. And he sovereignly spoke to her as she was expecting to die. There were those who experienced and were used of God in mighty ways since the close of Scripture who gave their all. A, a limitless hunger for more. Leonard Ravenhill, he says, we're too soon satisfied. Let that hunger continue to burn. Stop getting satisfied so soon when it comes to things of God. Amen. Say, oh, i got to have more. I've got to experience more. And you understand, this is not like we, we want more money or we more prestige or position. No, I just want more of God. I've got to. I just have to. I just have to experience more. It doesn't depend upon your position in society or the money in your bank account or the food in your stomach. It's a hunger for more. And the people who have been used by God in unbelievable ways since the close of Scripture, the people we read about in our history books who've done great things for God, they refuse to be satisfied with good enough. 
They refuse to say, I've just, well, okay, yep, I did that. All right, now I'm set. They said, there's more. And God rewarded that with experience and an ability to bless other people as they walked into 